So I'd like to start by telling you the story of what a computer does the minute you push the power button. Um, it's basically this slide that we left off with in class today. So the machine cycle, or other, otherwise known as the fetch, decode, execute cycle. And basically, um, these three steps describe how processors get instructions out of memory and decide what to do with them. So the first step is I've got to go off to memory and retrieve the instruction. The reason why this is a step is the instruction is stored in multiple memory locations. So in this class, we have two memory locations for a single instruction. The fetch part of the cycle is going to read those two memory addresses and put the instruction together in a single register uh, known as the instruction register. Uh, on a real computer, the instruction might be in many different memory cells, and so this is a much more involved uh, process than uh, the make-believe machine we're using this week. Now, the next step is to decode that instruction, and like we saw in class, you just look at the hex codes, go up to the table, and decide, okay, um, you know, one is a, a load, and two or three is a store, or whatever they are in the table, and that's going to then activate the circuitry in the processor that executes the instruction. So, you know, executing might just be loads and stores, it might be an add, it might be multiply or divide in another language, it might be um, jump or halt and, and so forth. Um, now this cycle happens over and over again, like billions of times a second. So it's a very fast sort of cycle, but it's nice because it breaks down the different steps that have to occur in order to run a program out of memory. One thing to note about the execute cycle is that uh, may affect the program counter or where to fetch the next instruction. So typically when you um, run an instruction it just increments the program counter by 2 that's going to go to the next memory location if assuming we have 16-bit instructions. Um, but sometimes the instruction might jump somewhere else in the program. So like if something is true go to this area of the program otherwise go to this other area. And all a jump instruction does is changes the value of the program counter which then fetches the next instruction somewhere else. So um, anyway, well, let's take a look at uh, the Brookshire simulator so we know how this all fits together. This week we'll use a simulator to explore how some of the machine instructions work that are described in the textbook Appendix C. And the way to find this simulator is right here on my website. Um, you can click on this Brookshire machine link and that will give you some instructions on how to run it. We'll go over the details during the lab. Today I'd just like you to focus on this sample program and what the simulator is actually doing. So I'm just going to pull this up. I already have it running. And I'll move the sample program here along the side so I can just type it in. And you'll see in the main screen what you can do is type in a single instruction in each of these cells here. So I might type in 200B. And you'll notice that as I type the instruction, it goes ahead and decodes it for me into English. So load register 0 with bit pattern 0B. I'll just type in some other ones, 2101. Um, 2202, 2301, and you can use the tab character to, or the tab key on the keyboard to go to the next cell. B2105121522. B008, and C000. So there are my 10 instructions for this program. Uh, let me show you some of the things that the simulator does for you. So you'll notice along the top here there's a memory list and a matrix, or memory matrix. If I click on memory matrix, this is what memory actually looks like. So remember, as we discussed in class, each um, cell of memory contains eight bits. That's why there's two hexadecimal digits. And you can just see memory is as a basically a, a matrix here that goes from 0 to F and then from 0 to F. So for example, this cell right here is at address 0, 3. Now, with memory list, we're looking at instructions. Remember, it takes two memory cells for each instruction, so that's why over on, on this view we see four hexadecimal digits at a time as opposed to seeing them in individual memory cells. Now, the way the simulator works is I can push the step button, and it will go ahead and highlight on the left um, what's happening. So, for example, this instruction here, uh, load register 0, it's, it's highlighting register 0 because the value is now um, 0B, which is that immediate value from the instruction. All right, and I can push step again. Now we're loading register 1 with the pattern 1, step, load register 2 with the bit pattern 0, 2, and so forth. And finally, load register 3 with the bit pattern 01. So by the way, let's take a step back and, and look at what this program is doing. Um, you'll note on the web page that describes the example is it's trying to calculate the sum of the numbers 1 through 10. Uh, by the way, that number tends to be uh, 55, 
but you'll see at the end that it's 37 in the machine because 37 in hexadecimal is 55 in decimal. All right, so how do we add the numbers 1 through 10? Well, um, I'm going to use in this program four different registers. So R0 is going to be what I call the limit. And you'll see this bit pattern 0B. Um, that's actually just the number 11. So if I want to add the numbers 1 through 10, I stop when I get to 11. Now R1 is the bit pattern 01. And so really what I think of that is the sum. If I'm trying to add all these numbers, I'll start with 1, and then I'll add 2, and then I'll add 3, and so forth. Um, the next register, uh, number 2, is going to be the counter. So in other words, I start with 2, then I do 3, then I do 4. Um, you know, so I'll just call that the counter. And finally, in register 3, I have the value 1. So this is a constant. I'm just going to add 1 every time to my counter to get the next number. OK, so you can see the next instruction says, um, if the bit pattern in register 2, in other words, if my counter, equals the value in register 0, or the limit, then jump to location 10. And you can see on location 10, that's going to halt the program. So because we're not done yet, I move to the next instruction. The next instruction says to add registers 2 and 1. So in other words, add my counter to my sum and store the result in register 1. So notice how register 1 is now the value 3, or in other words, 1 plus 2. Um, the next step is going to add the values in registers 2 and 3. So in other words, I want to add 1 to my counter. And now my counter is 3, or the next number in the sequence. And this says if bit pattern in register 0 equals the value in register 0. Notice how it's comparing 0 with itself. Um, in this language, that's how you do an unconditional jump. You know, 0 is always going to equal 0. So at this point of the program, I want to jump back to the instruction at um, address 8. And that does that if statement again. So I'm just going to push the run button now, which ends up being the same thing as step, 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 step over and over again. And you can see over time how the sum is being computed in register 1. Eventually here, register 2 is going to get up to 9, 10. And when it hits 11, it's going to finish and halt execution. So that, in a nutshell, is how the Brookshire machine works. You basically just enter in um, instructions. You can also look at individual memory cells. And you have the contents of the register, registers here on the left, and also the program counter on the bottom left to see what's going on. Um, if I want to rerun this program, I can push the reset button. That basically resets all the registers to 0 and um, sets the program counter to 0 as well. But it doesn't change the contents of memory. So you don't want to reset your program in the middle of um, running that. Of course, there's some other features in here as well if you just explore the menus and, and so forth. Now let's talk about the handout that I gave you in class, which is basically a one-page version of Appendix C from the textbook. Uh, something that I find is very useful to understand how the instructions are organized is to go ahead and take notes directly on this sheet. Um, and let's do that right now and talk about what each one of these means. So notice we start out with um, instructions 1 and 2 that are both called load. Uh, the difference between these two instructions is the first one loads the contents of a memory cell, whereas the second one loads a specific value. So there's a difference, uh, like we saw last week as well, between reading memory cell number 5 and putting the value 5 in your program. So hence we have two different load instructions. We also have um, a store instruction which takes the contents of a register and stores that in main memory. Finally, a move instruction which means uh, copy the value from register R to register S. Now some of you had a question last week about the word move. Um, it, it was in one of the exercises when we were talking about ones and zeros. Really this type of move means copy. Move data across the bus or move data from one register to another. We're not actually deleting the contents of register R in this example. We're really just copying the data over. So these instructions 1 through 4 are all data related instructions. They have to deal with moving data on and off uh, the processor. The next set of instructions have to do with arithmetic. So we have adding bit patterns as though they were two's complement rep representations. By the way, we didn't talk about two's complement in the course, but that's another way of saying integer um, or whole numbers. And um, you'll see instruction number six is adding registers as if they were floating point, or in other words, um, fractional numbers. So a two's complement number is like five or negative five. A floating point number is like 
5.5 or negative 1.2. So uh, it's called a floating point because that decimal point can move around. And you don't have to worry about uh, those details. Of course, you can read those sections in the book to learn more about it. But basically, the binary version of a floating point number is different from an integer number. And so there's two different instructions because they correspond to different types of adder circuits. Um, now, these are both called arithmetic instructions. Of course, you'll have other arithmetic in a real processor, like the ability to subtract and to multiply and divide and so forth. Um, the next set of instructions are logic instructions, OR, AND, XOR. Uh, we learned about those last week. There's also one in section 2.4 of the book this week about rotate. Basically, that means takes a bit, take a bit pattern like, I don't know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and rotate it to the right um, x times, right? So that would basically take a bit and swap it around. So you'd have one at the end with all zeros if you were to rotate it to the right once. Um, you can read about the other examples in the book. So 7 through A are logic, uh, 5 through 6 are arithmetic, and together these are the arithmetic logic unit, or ALU, um, you know, the instructions 5 through A. And of course, in a real processor, there's a lot more. Finally, we have instructions B and C. Uh, B is the jump instruction. That's how we um, implement things like loops and if then statements and other logic in a program. Um, basically, all you're doing is jumping to a new memory location to execute instructions there. And the other control instruction we have is C, which means halt. Now, C is always, always followed by three zeros. Uh, there's no need for an operand for the C instruction. In fact, if you give it other numbers, the machine probably would ignore them anyway. And halt doesn't mean just stop the program. It basically means turn off the computer. So you really only run the halt um, execution instruction when like everything is said and done. Okay, so that's in a nutshell what we have for our 12 instructions. And you'll notice that they're organized just like that figure in the slides today that talked about, you know, there's the data registers, there's the ALU, and there's the control unit. So the three parts of the processor correspond to these three types of instructions.